Okay, now you can hear me, but you're, but you're probably not hearing me great. Now, hold on one second. You do now. All right, everybody. I'm Captain Tommy Scoville, and you were on the lifeboat. Thank you for your patience. Five by five. All right. All right. See this thing? There we go. How are you? I'm Captain Tommy Scoville, and you're on the lifeboat. Anthony Powell, good to see you, man. While you're waiting, hit that uh, thumbs up button. He says, Kelly, good to see you. Meredith Lynn, how are you? Hello, man. What's happening? Mary Mary and Davey, tree hugger. Good to see you. Brazy, what's happening? Meredith Lynn. Kelly B69. There you are. What's up, convict? Sandra Ferguson, good to see you. Valerie Smith, what's happening? Ellie, the Midnight Show. Oh, oh. I love her. Rhonda with Rhonda McDonald. Mc... You know what, Rhonda? I'm sorry. Your last name always makes me think of the uh, actor from um, what do you call it? Spinal Tap. Um, Bayou Babe, Sandra Ferguson, Scoob. Hope you're doing better, Scoop. Anthony, what's happening? Midwest Kid Doc. I was thinking of you this morning. Uh, Franklin Four, what's happening? Jeremy Fowler, how are you? All right, listen, let's get this thing rolling. So I'm on the road. I'm doing my business. You people know that I have a lot to do with watches. And one of the things that I do is uh, I sell watches to movie companies. Um, and sometimes we discuss the possible uh, watches. If you film a movie that takes place in the 20s, Calhoun did a fantastic job. We're going to talk about it. When, uh, if you film a film that's made in the 20s and 30s or the 10s, you can't put a modern watch on that person. It's not going to look normal. So what you're looking for is something with a vintage look. Say something that looks like it might have come out of the 20s. Like this watch here, for instance. See, here's the thing, though. This watch was never manufactured. I made this watch. I took a woman's pendant watch, right? You wear around the neck. And then I bought an old tin case that's hundreds of years old from a company called Keystone. And I drilled a hole into the side of the case so that I could extend out the winding crown because you couldn't shorten the winding crown on one of these. And I made this kind of trying to make it look like it was steampunky or whatever. I mentioned this because it's one of a kind. There are others that are similar, but... This says Waltham on it, and Waltham never made this watch. Tommy Scoville did. Okay. So I sent up, I sent up 50, maybe 100 pictures to this film company and said, here are some watches that would fit perfectly for the time period. Now, I've already done films with these people before. I am their research on it. I will say to them, none of these watches, you can't use these because they came from the 40s or whatever the case may be. They opted not to go with me on this film, which was a bummer, but it is what it is. Then a couple of days ago, a friend of mine called and he said, hey, I'm trying to find a watch. And I said, OK, what are we looking for? And he says, I'm looking for like a steampunky uh, tin um, watch. You know, the when they first started making watches, this was a company that made a, a case and you had to kind of build a watch. And he said, so I'm looking for one of those old tin cases that Keystone would make. And I said, oh, okay. He's like, and I'm looking for one of the earliest watches Waltham ever made, put in one. And I didn't click at the time that I, what I said to him was, Waltham didn't do that. So that watch doesn't exist. Then I got a phone call this morning from the people who were making the movie. And they said, there's a bunch of watches that we need and we need them by Monday. Right? We're in a hurry. We screwed up. And I said, okay. The first watch they sent me a picture of that they needed, I said, if you scroll up 15 watches, you'll see that watch. I already sent you a picture of it. That was in the package that I mailed over. Also in the package was this watch right here. You've been asking people to find this watch for you so you could try to go around me and get it cheaper. But this watch doesn't exist. And when you send pictures of a watch that doesn't exist to watch people to find, they might just find the guy that made it. So I'm salty. Do you understand why? These people have been using me to do all of their research, right? And then they go out and buy the watches or rent the watches from other people. That's a bummer, right? It's really bad form. It is super bad form. Then these geniuses did something else. They took the actor, and they won't ever tell me who the actor is or anything, but he's a big dog. Whoever he is, he's a big dog. They don't want to upset this guy at all. And they took a book 
and they showed him all kinds of pictures. And he picked out a watch that he wants to wear for this film that was really popular in the 20s. He picked out an Elgin Parisian. It's one of the most unbelievably beautiful watches you've ever seen. The Parisian by Elgin, Art Deco, asymmetrical. When you look at it, it looks like the watch is moving. It almost looks like it's coming off because of how they use triangles and shapes. Absolutely stunning. Never made for a man. <laughs> but in a picture, the actor couldn't tell this. See, that's why you use a consultant because the Parisian is conservatively speaking, right? About that big, right? That's what we're looking at. That's the size of that watch, right? It is so small. It's smaller than a postage stamp. But see, they showed him a book and it was in a blow up this big. And that actor went, I want that. So now these jack wagons have got to try to figure out a way to find a watch that doesn't exist to make this actor happy. And they got until Monday. And I said to them, well, there's some other things out there. Oh, and then they said, oh, well, then we'll take this one, right? What was that? 1500 bucks? Well, maybe, you know, 90 days ago. <laughs> now I'm a little angry. Now, now I don't feel like I got treated very well by these people. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not all that fired up to help them out. So we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Now let's talk about Spanx Calhoun. Huh? So when you go on the road um, and you're a, a producer of a show, um, I mean, you're a, uh, you have a, a producer. Very often, the, the person will say to the producer, hey, can you, you know, I want you to do some stuff while I'm gone. Um, you know what? <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> I wish Johnny Scoville was watching this because he would have loved that comment. Uh, that's all right, Kathy. A great comment because that's exactly what happened. They turned around and now they're in deep, deep trouble. You have no idea how badly I'm going to do these guys for real. And I told them that on the phone. I'm not joking. I said, you are going to get screwed on this one and you're going to learn that and the, here's the funny thing i said the watch the guy wants is a hamilton diamond because it looks enough like the parisian and it was made the first picture i sent you for this film when you said that there was a stud i said this is the watch the stud would be wearing now the stud wants to put on a woman's watch anyway so when you go on the road and you say uh i don't know how much i'm going to be able to do very often when I go on the road, the purpose I'm going on the road has to do with YouTube. So I'm going to be sitting in front of the, the camera a lot, right? Um, I did see the three kids that robbed a bank, uh, Danny, and I'll talk about that. Uh, so you, you, you go on the road and you, and you think to yourself, um, this time, I'm, this is a business deal, people. This is a straight business deal. This has got nothing to do with YouTube, so to speak, All right? This is much more nuts and bolts stuff, which is... Probably what I did more of in as far as business. Like I understand what I'm doing right now. It's it's almost in my wheelhouse, but it isn't YouTube. So as I'm as I'm leaving, I'm saying to Spanky, you know, he says, Are we going live? Obviously, people, the day is coming where this isn't going to be my my lifeboat. Right. I don't think anybody, you know, thinks I'll be doing this in 45 years, right? Um, the day is coming where Spanx Calhoun will probably be sitting in the uh, in the helm. It's great to uh to, to let him run. And it's also terrifying. It really is. Because when you build so much time building something um, and you care so much about the people involved, if you knew the respect it takes for a dad to let his kid do what I let my son do twice in a row, I don't think, I don't think you guys can, can really wrap your dome around the, uh, what it takes to say, I'm going to let you do that. Right? Thank you, Tina Marie. This is the official shirt of the lifeboat. If you are a member of the lifeboat, you see the, uh, um, the, the picture of Captain Tommy. This is what he's wearing. This is the official, uh, this is the official uh, hoodie of the, uh, of the lifeboat. Spanx did a brilliant job. Did he not? I mean, did he not for real? I am so much happier uh, than I thought I was going to be. Now, I'm going to beat him up. I am. He's, his dad's a public speaker. He knows it. There's uh, there's some things that we're going to be, uh, you know, that we're going to be working on. But I'll be really honest. With you. I'm not going to beat him up the way I thought I was going to. You know, I anticipated um, this is a new thing for Spanky. Spanky's a great communicator. But what we're doing now is a form of public speaking of sorts. It's new to him. 
Now he's fearless, which is one of the greatest things that you can be if you're going to sit in front of a camera. Calhoun does not fear um, the camera. That's amazing, right? Because most people do. Um, and some of that probably is because he grew up with Papa Scoville, with, with me and with Johnny, and we're, we're a communicating family. Um, you know, we are, we're big on communicating. We spent we spend a tremendous amount of time uh, talking. Um, Spanx did do a great job. Doc says, Tommy, I won't let anybody on or in my bikes or cars. I get it. And I'll tell you something. This is so much bigger to me than a bike or a car. However, um, what it really does come down to isn't desperation at all. I can just not do a show. And when I come back, even more people will watch. If I disappear for five days, the next show I do is going to be a monster. It's just how it works. But I care way too much about the people on the boat to disappear. Right? Everybody needs to come together for connection because it has become something that is a very important part of our lives for a lot of people here, if not everybody. So uh, I don't have a problem um, letting uh, Calhoun take the chair. And I'm going to be coming more and more. Absolutely. What I would really love to do, Anthony, is I'm going to do some shows where it's Calhoun and I. We're going to do some uh, some tandem shows together uh, so that we uh, we he gets a feel of working one on one with the old man. Right? It'll be fun. It'll be like going to work day. And we'll do uh, we're going to be doing some call in stuff. What you guys don't know is we have the call in figured out. We really do. The uh, now. That doesn't mean there won't be some uh, some uh, troubleshooting, you know, that comes along the way, because that's absolutely how this works. We have to, you know, to do some troubleshooting. But what we have got is the phone system that the, uh, you know, the, the Rush Limbaugh show <laughs> would be using. Any any uh, real legitimate, no joke kind of call in show has this set up. So uh, we're, we're, we're going to go hard to the paint. The future of the lifeboat is call in. Right. When we did videos, I came out and I said, hey, we need to work on some crap. Go back and watch my old stuff. I said, this is going to be a call. I mean, this is going to be a, uh, a live show. Doesn't mean there might not be a video or two while we get this figured out, but this is going to be a live show. Um, I'm going to uh, the, the lifeboat is going to become a call in program. It is the future of, uh, of what we do. And it's going to be the future of what we do, I would imagine, for whoever is sitting in that chair. We will always have a subject. Right. But there are going to be very often we're going to do shows during the week where we might talk for the first 10 minutes or whatever. And then we're going to open up so that if, as always happens on the lifeboat, I say something that jars something loose in you and makes you start to think about something instead of typing, yeah, I've been through that. You have the opportunity to pick up a phone and call. Now, I'll tell you something else. Anybody can pick up the phone and call. You hear me? Anybody can pick up the phone and call. There is no, hey, this is the best friends of the lifeboat. Hey, we don't pick and choose. Every once in a while, someone will say something. When you sell memberships, you get people who go, oh, membership stuff. You know what? Every, everything I do, you guys are going to get. Sometimes I'm going to give it out to the members uh, beforehand. But who's BSing who, right? With the amount of, of time and effort that we do here on the boat, um, there really isn't a lot of time left to do just about anything. I wish we could do 25 times more uh, than we do in terms of production. Calhoun becoming able to sit in this chair and do it every, every single time, short notice, and be able to do it like me is going to make this boat into something completely different. You will be able to call from outside the United States, D. Audrey Gore. And I'll tell you something. This is the truth. When you get to the very end of the entire thing and they describe to you this package, you can put people on, uh, people will come in in the queue and the producer will be able to talk to three people or I'd see the three or five people that he could have on hold waiting while other people are calling in and just getting a ringing symbol, uh, a ringing sound. The others will be in a queue waiting to come on. The producer will be able to ask the, what the question is that they're going to ask or what they want to talk about. And I'll actually be able to even see that on the screen before it pops up or Reese will if, uh, if it's the Reese and Tommy in the show. We're doing a related boat kind of thing. But either way, all of that control will be there. But when you get to the very end and they tell you what the cost is and all of that, then they go, oh, we want to do that worldwide or just in the United States. And it absolutely doubles 
what the price is. But we have a massive audience outside the U.S. I used to say, right, that um, over 20% of our audience was outside the U.S., which we were pretty uh, damn proud of. As we have grown, um, it has shrunk. So, uh, but the pool has gotten bigger. So right now, about 17% of our audience is not in the U.S., which I'm blown away by. Um, I think that's that's huge. We do need to get uh, Spanx better lighting. Absolutely. And that's on me, not spanking. Um, to be honest, I have the lighting. But this is my, uh, this is my 1963 split window coupe, right? This is my, uh, this is my, uh, my restoration project. And I'll be honest, when I was leaving, every time I leave, I say to Spanky, I'll have you, I'll have you do a show while I'm gone. And then I go, nah, I can't do it. And it's not that I don't have faith in my kid. Because if I didn't have faith in my kid, I sure as crap wouldn't have moved him to where uh, I live to help me with the boat, right? I have more faith in my kid than I have in anybody else on this planet. I kid you not. Um, the, the one person I know on earth isn't going to screw me over is my son, right? My son and my brother. There aren't a lot of people I can, I can really say that about, but I, uh, I fear nothing with, uh, with Calhoun. But I definitely threw him under the bus. Like I started yesterday when it, or what, well, I've been here a couple of days. When I was in the airport, um, I called him and said, you know, maybe I'll have you do one tomorrow. And then that day I said, maybe I'll have you do one. And I probably gave him about 25 minutes notice. I called and said, all right, you ready to do this? And that's probably the way you do it. It wasn't an accident, I promise you. If I give Calhoun nine days to get ready to do a show, he's going to kill it. He's a communicator. But if I go, you got to go live in 30 minutes, right? Um, well, you know, he needs, he needs to be lit from the back. He needs a, he needs a we're going to go, we're, we'll do two lights and, and we'll do it side so you don't get, he doesn't wear glasses, which is cool, but we're going to light him from the sides. We'll have two ring lights. We're going to do it. It's going to be professionally lit. I promise. We just didn't. Uh, this is just dad being dad. If you got a kid, you know what I mean? It's hard to, it's hard to do this. This is a difficult process to do. It says so much about father and son and everything else. You know what I mean? It's, it's the most beautiful thing in the world and it hurts. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like saying you're getting ready to die, you know? Uh, Reese will be so excited. She loves the call-in shows. She would love all her shows to be call-ins. You know what, uh, Marie? I sent uh, her a text message right after I found out what uh, this um, system is capable of. And she went, oh, my God, and did the Reese thing. Like, uh, you know what's funny? I have I have picked on every girl I've ever known. If they get all happy like that, I always do kind of the, uh, the pick on the girl voice. And they all get so bummed out about it, right? Reese laughs hysterically. When I clown Reese for uh, for making the Reese sound, the Reese noise, she laughs like I can make her fall down laughing if I do it. And she's probably not watching, right? She's on the road. Uh, anybody know what time zone she's in? Reese, if you're lurking, let me know you're lurking because I want to talk about you, but I don't want to talk about you if you're here. <laughs> Tommy, how could you not be remembered? You're unforgettable. That's what y'all thank you. But Calhoun, I'm telling you, he's going to make people forget me. That's his job. It's what, uh, it's what sons do. Sadly, it is what sons do. Uh, I am going to be, since Reese didn't pop up to say hello, she may not be here. I'm going to write a song, right? You know the song Tragedy by the Bee Gees? So I was riding around uh, and we were actually going out to um, to dinner with the people I was with who probably think I'm not all there, right? Because uh, one of them said, oh, they went to, to mess with the stereo and they're like, you're gonna hate this. I said, what is it? And they were like, disco. I'm like, actually, you're not gonna bum me out with disco. I'm like, I kind of dig disco, believe it or not, right? Um, and they kicked on the, uh, they kicked it on, there was a Bee Gees song, but you know the song Tragedy by the Bee Gees? So I'm in the backseat of this car laughing hysterically because I can literally hear her voice going, oh my God, right? And every time they said tragedy, I'm going to rewrite that song and I'm going to do it uh, to Reese freaking out. Like when rain calls and her, oh my God, it's rain on the phone. And I can't wait, wait until you hear it. I promise you, you're going to die. I've, uh, I've been in the process of, uh, of, of getting this thing sketched out. It's going to be one of the funniest things ever when it's done. It really, really is going to be fun. Disco is great. I'm sorry. I love disco. 
You know what, Valerie? Uh, it's a very, very cool friendship. It's also a, a challenging friendship like no other. And I don't say that in a bad way because anything in life that's worth a fart is a challenge. But we, we have, um, and this is a great, it's a, it's a study almost in human nature, I think, right? The reason that it's fascinating for people to watch Reese and I together, in my opinion, is because um, Reese grew up in prison, right? And, and got out after she was an adult. And I grew up as free as you could be and then went to prison as an adult. And we're both survivors of, of a really horrific prison system, right? Um, and it's, uh, we're so different than everybody else, right? Reese is not a normal girl. And I'm not saying that in any disrespect at all. Reese is not even remotely like any other girl I've ever met. And it's because of her upbringing. But I promise you, I'm not like any other dude you've met. And it's because of, uh, of what my upbringing was, right? I had every benefit you could possibly have. I did. I had, I should have been a president. I had great parents that stayed together forever who loved each other. My dad didn't hit my mom. I saw what love was, right? My dad was so great to my mom. My mom was so great to my dad. I watched that stuff. It was how I grew up. There was no reason for me to end up the way I did, right? But because of that, I get a completely different perspective on the prison system than a lot of people. Because I walked in there not having been broken by my parents and then dumped into a system that was going to raise me. I got raised perfectly and then got dumped into a system that I had the equipment in my head to realize how bad it was. Because truthfully, half of the people in there had zero perspective. The fact that we're being beaten and treated bad or whatever, they've been, like, they've been doing that since they were four. Okay. It's just pro forma. It's what they're used to. It's, uh, it's fascinating to watch the two of us communicate because we are really, really so different. And we are so, so much alike, you know? And I, and I know that everybody has a very easy time seeing the, uh, the differences, but I don't know if you guys, it, it's probably a lot more difficult to, uh, to see how much the two of us are alike. Um, well, you know what, uh, Jeremy Fowler and everybody else that's paying attention, this is a shit place to be. I'm sorry for my language. I got to do better. I really do. That, that just shows that I'm not, that I'm in relapse in all honesty. I'm going in the wrong direction. If I'm doing that, I'm not controlling myself. It's usually cause I'm not going in the right direction. Uh, similar situation, great upbringing fell into the wrong group. Okay. There are a large large group of people out there who can't blame their drug addiction on their parents, right? And it sucks to be us because the system doesn't want to hear it. If you get in there and say, I got great parents, the first thing they're going to say is no, no, let's, let's back up because there's something you're repressing because it happened when you were a kid. And do you know why they do that? Because if we can blame it on somebody else, do you know how easy it is to fix? For real. Let's get a straw man. With all due respect, I'm going to do this, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's the truth. I sent my first wife to rehab, Spanky's mom. And I remember the first meeting I had with that rehab people. It was me and my current wife and the counselor. And I knew I was divorced before they said nine words. She went to that place, and they told her that there was only one reason that she was an alcoholic, or two reasons, really. But it was me and her dad were the reasons that she was a drunk. So it was a real shocker when she married a woman from the rehab. Now, she's not with that woman anymore. It's not a good thing to get into relationships when you are brand new in sobriety. It can be a very dangerous thing. But they don't want to admit that there are people out there who got addicted to drugs in spite of the fact that they had a great childhood. See, that screws up their whole game plan. Without somebody to blame it on, you have to blame it on yourself. You have to take responsibility for what you did. You have to go, that's me. I did this. Well, that's a bitch to do because no one wants to let you. Because they know that if you take responsibility, and by they, I mean the, 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 the people who do rehab, right? The rehab community. They know that the number one thing that's going to cause somebody to relapse is guilt. 
right? Forget hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Those are all bad. Guilt is what drives every addict back. They can't live with the life that they, uh, what they did in the life. And it drives them so backtrack crazy that they make that feeling go away by doing more dope. And the next thing you know, you're 75 or 80, right? No lie. They, they do not want, they do not want you to take responsibility because the guilt will eat you alive. A completely different concept on this, right? And this is here it is the rubber meets the road. This is the light bulb, right? Here's why we're different because here's my theory, right? What you did when you were on dope, you're not responsible for. That doesn't mean you don't have to take responsibility because you do, right? I, I robbed those banks, and you know what I did? I went to prison and did time for it. I ran guns illegally. I went to prison and did time for it. I cheated on my wife, got divorced, right? All of the things that I've done wrong, I've paid for. Yeah. But I wasn't steering the boat when that happened. Yeah. Because Tommy Stobel wouldn't walk into a bank and tell a teller that he's never met who did nothing wrong to stick all of the cash up on the counter. That's not me. I have been promise you that's not me. It's not how I was raised and it's not who I am. So how did that happen? Somewhere along the way, I gave the keys, right, to Brett, the previous vehicle, to heroin. And heroin drove that crap into the side of a wall at 500 miles an hour. Sadly, I then had to drive away from that, okay? So for me, the realization that no one in their right mind robs banks. No one in their right mind robs banks. Those three little kids, you know what that was, right? They're not going to do time the same way, right? The chances are at least one of them is tipped up, meaning in a gang. The gang wants to get some cash. These kids got to jump in, right? They're going to do something to get into the gang. Sometimes they say, 25 of us are going to beat the crap out of you. You get jumped into the gang. Sometimes they say, you got to go put work in. We want somebody stabbed. Sadly, there have been many cases where to get into the gang, you had to kill someone and they just randomly pick somebody in a park. Right. But there's something that people have to do in order to enter, right, these, um, these prison gangs or these, you know, there's a, a lot of different foul things. No one in their right mind allows any of these things to happen. No one in their right mind, right, allows themselves to be taken over by anything. Those little kids, you got a gang leader that says, you're going to go in there and rob that bank. And here's why. You get to join the, the uh, gang if you do it, right? Now they're going to keep the cash. If these kids get popped, what are they going to go? They're going to go to juvie. They're going to go to uh, the, the uh, CYA, the California Youth Authority, right? They're going to get tossed into whatever uh, little jail they're going to be in. And most of them are going to get out at 18. If they killed somebody, they're going to get out at 25. So this gets done a lot with gangs. If they got youngsters and, they, and, a, and a youngster wants to get in a gang, they can use them to do crime because it's just not going to be the same thing. Shame is completely different than guilt. It absolutely is. It absolutely is, right? I'm guilty for what I did. I am not ashamed of the things that I've done anymore. I, I paid for them. I paid for them. I forgave myself. Now, forgiving yourself, forgiveness does not mean everything is okay. What you did is all right. I'm giving it a pass. I get people who call me. By the way, calling is a ubiquitous term I use because I don't talk to any of you. So if you're offended that I don't talk to you, I, what I mean is I am in conversation with somebody because I don't talk to a lot of people, but I text and email and do all that with a bunch of is. But I'm working with somebody who survived uh, an essay, right? A vicious essay. And I can't, uh, I can't understand what this person's going through. I promise I can't. Now, to cope with this, this person does two or three grams of dope a day. That I understand completely. I understand wanting to make your head go away. So I can work with this person. But this person said to me, 
You have done shows on forgiveness. You want to tell me how I forgive this person? The root of the word forgive is to give away, right? Literally. It's not to heal. It's not to accept. It's not to say, okay, it's to give away. So if that person did that, she gave that person away. She gave away all of it. And the punishment is now being doled out by the prison system. This guy got life in prison. She's not forgiving this person in the sense that she's going to go, what you did to me is okay. She's forgiving this person in the sense of, I'm done with you. I'm giving away what you did. I'm giving away all of this. And you know what? The prison system can have you. And, you know, I take solace in the fact that the prison system really does have a way of taking care of people like that. For real. And God forbid the guy that did that ends up someplace where I know somebody. Right? That's, uh, by the way, that's something that didn't see coming but happens a lot because of this, because of the boat. If you knew the number of people who have reached out to me and said, hey, my ace deuce is in and they tell me what prison he's in, I swear to God, I've been keeping a notebook. I'm starting to write down the names of everybody I know I got in the prison because if one of these guys ends up in one, I don't have to ask the dude to do anything. You just need to let that guy know that this guy's in his unit. He ain't going to handle it. He's just going to start. He's just going to go, oh, man, somebody on the street was telling me about this dude. I'm telling you, I'm keeping a big notebook. You got friends in prison, send me an email. It's hard, isn't it, all? Really, really hard. But I think it's hard because we we lose a grip on what it means to forgive. If I'm forgiving my son, right, it isn't different, believe it or not. I want to give away whatever the problem is between us. Now, we can agree to what we give it away to. But we want whatever we're working through. By the way, Ellen and I are getting along fantastic. She used to get us this up. But whatever we're working through, we want to ensure that when we're done, we don't have to revisit it. We're not going to come back and talk about this in a year. That's one of the worst things human beings do, really. You say, I'm sorry. Yeah, I forgive you. And then three days later, they go, well, you did that two days ago, didn't you? It's like, wait a sec. Didn't you just say that that was forgiven? Then don't tell me I did it, right? Don't say you forgive me until you're done talking about it. I'm cool. We can talk about it for two years. But when you say I forgive you, I don't want to hear it ever again because that's how I do it. Right? Say you're sorry to me. I'm not going to go, yeah, I forgive you. Not until I'm done talking about it. And I might need to bring it up. I might need to bring it up in a, in a, in a month. Huh. I said sorry to somebody that took 19 months to say I forgive you. And I lived with them at the time. Because there was a lot this person needed to talk about. <laughs> they, wanted, they wanted to get this down to, uh, and you know what? I get it. I get it. But the problem is this forgiveness thing, it gets a bad rap. Yeah, I want to forgive my son to a point where I can give him a big hug and a kiss and say, it's over. It's done. We're never going to bring this up again. It's as far as East is from West. It's in our past. I'm not going to let it taint our future going forward or any of that crap. Now, could I do that to somebody that essayed me? Of course not. But I could say, I'm not going to allow you to be a part of my life anymore. I'm not. I'm going to work more diligently on making sure that you don't affect me more. You already did what you're going to do. I would like to, uh, to make sure that I give you away. And I don't want you in my life. And I know that's a lot more difficult than it is, right? It's, it's very easy to say. It's much more difficult to do. By the way, if I ever say that something is much easier to say than do, then I got a great suggestion. And that suggestion would be <laughs> that anytime something is way harder, than uh, to, to say than do. Get out a, a book and a pen and start writing about that. Sit down and write. Why is it so much more difficult to write this? I mean, to, to speak this than it is to write this and just start writing and see what happens. By the way, journals. Somebody sent me a really crappy uh, uh, thing about the journals. People, guess what? We're not a production company. We're a crappy little YouTube channel. And in the process of trying to get these things printed, we got screwed twice. Now, we have somebody that we're going with, and we're going to have, uh, have it available in digital downloads and in regular so that you can get it. The digital download concept was because they said to me, are you really trying to make as much money as possible? Or are you trying to get this in the hands of people as fast as you can for as cheap as you can? I'm not trying to make as much money as possible. It's really not what we're doing here. 
right? If so, I probably picked the wrong line of work. There are no stupid questions. Tommy, stupid question. But is it possible that you're feeling like relapsing could be purely biological or neurological um, as it's going on at the same time as your health started uh, and getting worse? Not a stupid question at all. At all. It's a great question. And this is going to come as a shock to you. Guess how you answer questions like this? You go back through your journal and you read the things that you've been writing that have been coming out of your head. I know when I kind of got off the rails and I am figuring out now um, why. And uh, so I have been very open about uh, sharing problems with, uh, with health or whatever's been going on. First of all, right now I'm doing great. I'm doing great. So, but I, I've been open about that and have shared a lot about my uh, health with the boat, but I've been struggling now for a hot minute. <laughs> This is this whatever's happening to me with uh, with me not moving forward anymore. Um, my health was is not new. Sadly, my health thing uh, has been going on now for a while. In fact, I think this is probably um, I have I'm in more control of my health um, currently. It doesn't mean I'm as healthy as I've ever been. I'm not trying to lie to anybody, but I am. I have a better plan and a better idea of um, of what I'm doing going forward than I ever have. My, uh, I can't tell you how long it's been since, or I could actually, I could tell you how long it's been, but uh, I was going into atrial flutter about three times a week, right? And I was able to get it back most times, three times I've had to go to the hospital for it. So they had to give me a drug to lower my, uh, to get my heart rate back into sinus rhythm. That doesn't happen anymore. It just doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because I have dramatically changed uh, my body, right? For starters, I got, I'm not carrying fat anymore on my body. I'm not, and I'm going to get less of it still. And I'm not doing this because I want to be on the cover of a magazine. I don't care what anybody looks like. I'm not doing this for any of those things, whether you believe that or not, I don't care. But I'm doing this because if I weigh less, my heart doesn't work as hard. And if I uh, am active and I work, then there's this plaque buildup that you don't get, which has a lot to do with helping the brain as well. So everything I'm doing, I'm not doing out of vanity. There was a time in my life where I did, right? But I'm not buying steroids. I'm not trying to juice up. What I'm trying to do is get to the lowest body mass index that I can healthily get to because the lower my BMI, the easier my heart's going to be working, right? And that, people... Um, has become the most important thing in the world to me is to make sure that my heart um, continues to beat for as long as humanly possible. I would like to, uh, I'd like to live the 90. I don't know that I would have said that three or four months ago. Just keeping it real. You know, with everything that was going on in my health and all of that, I was getting to the point a few months back where I kind of didn't feel like doing this anymore. You know, the, the, the physical and all of that was getting to the point where it was wearing me down. And I am on a medication now uh, that, I, that I got from the neurologist that is doing absolute wonders for me. Uh, if all of you, for those of you who have been watching the boat a long time, most of you have already reached out and said to me, I don't know what's going on, but boy, you seem bad. Well, you could literally track it to when I started on this medication. The previous two that they tried me on, I felt nothing. I don't feel anything on this one either, but boy, oh boy, is my concentration back. You know, I really, Boo Radley, good to see you. How you doing? Um, so I feel uh, better than I ever had as an adult, you know, as a 50 year old. This is, uh, this is as good a, a space as I've ever been. Headspace, my body needs some work still. There's still some work that, that needs uh, some stuff done, but I'm working on it. Well, thank you. Awaken says, I want to thank you, Tommy, for the inspiration you give me to start being uh, health conscious uh, and also taking care of yourself enough to stay healthy for this boat. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You know what? It's got a lot to do with it, too. I'm not going to lie. Queen Olive, how are you, Ruthann? Two years ago, I lost the 60 pounds I gained while uh, having eight back surgeries. My Lord. Took myself off narcotics and I'm the healthiest I've been in years. It took work. Congratulations for getting off. 
of uh, uh, those narcotics. Eight back surgeries. Learn a lesson, people. No one has one back surgery, right? If you have had one back surgery, you had it very recently. Because unfortunately, back surgeries lead to more back surgeries. And that's, that's tough. Oh, Amber, I'm so sorry. She says, my heart is not uh, great. I have AFib and a, uh, and a uh, probably leaky AR valve, uh, mild. Sometimes I wonder if it's from not being taken care of when I was a kid in the cult of Scientology. I would say that that's a really safe bet. And I'm sorry to say that, Amber. But yeah, I knew what you meant. Um, I, do, I actually have a uh, leaky AR valve too, but it is so minor. Every time they look at it, they're like, it's almost not worth mentioning, but they always mention it anyway, because I think they just like bumming you out. But mine leaks very, very, very minorly. Um, absolutely, Queen All Proudy, that's great stuff. It really is. Uh, getting uh, after eight surgeries to uh, to not be taking uh, narcotics for pain, you're a beast in the best of ways. God bless you. <laughs> My son is air, air fist in the sky. He's pretty happy for you. So, uh, but. All of us, it is Scientology, you know, says Kelly. Make no mistake. There are horrific stories, horrific stories of how kids were treated. And the, the, the stories just keep coming out. They just keep getting worse. And guess what? Uh, we're, we're waking up, right? We're waking up as a world. You know I'm going to have to, uh, you know I'm going to have to talk about Nickelodeon here on the boat, right? There's not going to be any not getting around, not talking about um, the sick show that had been going on at Nickelodeon forever. Apparently, that was just a place if uh, if you were someone that liked to victimize kids, Nickelodeon was a great place to work. Um, there, there, there has to be a renaissance in this world when it comes to protecting children, right? And the cult of Scientology is a great first target. It is that crap show and what they do to kids. And I mean, they do it to everybody, right? They destroy people enough to treat kids the way they do. That's more frightening if you think about it in those terms. What you have to do to a human being to destroy that parental feeling that literally we're born with, to beat that out of a human being, the damage they do to the parents who then do it to the kids, that thing's got to go. Everyone used to look at you sideways because you weren't allowed to watch Nickelodeon. Um, there were, there are definitely, uh, apparently, allegedly, allegedly, Amanda Bynes was impregnated by somebody there and then had to abort the child. This is one of the allegations that uh, that is coming out. Um, this is the sickest crap in the entire world. And you know what? That poor girl has been struggling horrifically for a really, really long time. Right. She's had a very, very tough go of it. And you know what? I wasn't particularly kind in the beginning when she was really going off the rails. I'm sure I cracked jokes because in the beginning I wasn't running the lifeboat and I didn't have an appreciation for a lot of stuff. But I'm sure I probably weighed in on the uh, on, on joking around about her being liquored up or pictures of her walking around naked. She did walk out of a out of a place that she lived with no clothing on. But it starts to make sense, doesn't it? Right. And it's not any, it's not that friggin funny anymore. That girl's literally been through hell. And now it makes so much sense, right? You know, you, you, not, you, she wasn't just SA, right? She was SA, and then the whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. By the way, this is male and female. We're going to be talking about it. It is the worst crap in the world. It really is. But it is way bigger than a television uh, network, right? It's way bigger than the cult of Scientology. What it is, is, systematically as a world, we're not taking care of our kids, right? Don't get me started on what's happening at the border, but we're not taking care of the kids on this planet. Human trafficking is at a, uh, maybe this has just always been this way, but we know now, right? We know now. And if you're not, if you're not part of the uh, solution in this one, then you're part of the problem. Um, if, if it's as simple as this, 
Don't ever turn on friggin' Nickelodeon again if you live to be a million. If that's all you do, make sure that that is blocked in your house. Let, let them realize that you're not going to allow a dollar to be made by scumbags that let this happen, right? That's not hard. That's not hard. If nothing else, Izzy nailed it too. To, to endure the trauma that, that these kids endured, if they endured it alone, right, with counselors there to help them, they endured it with the entire world staring at them, expecting them to be smiling so hard it hurts at all times, right? Good God. I would, yeah, there may not be Nickelodeon. Find out who, uh, find out the parent companies, right? Who owns it? Stop watching everything. Literally, stuff's got to stop. But I think we're getting to a point. Thank you. I think we're getting to a point where um, we need to do something, right? We really need to. All right, people. What's happening is I am getting to, I normally run these puppies an hour. I am going to be uh, walking out of here uh, at noon, so I have to go and, uh, and do a lunch. But this was a little uh, downtime, and I wanted to uh, pop on and say hello to everybody. I am going to be uh, going live later today uh, with uh, Taekwondo for Life. Um, if we could get one of the uh, mods to put the link up for that. Rhonda, I, yeah, says, Rhonda says, uh, Amber, hearing stories from Reese and Natalie, et cetera, it's so heartbreaking. I hope you're getting the help that you need, as do I. And I and I would encourage everybody, regardless of how you're hurting, right, to, to do it, uh, to not do it in, uh, in silence, right? Don't suffer in silence. If, if you're hurting, talk to people. If it's not here, go talk to somebody somewhere else, right? If we're not your groove, if this isn't for you, but go find some place that you can because uh, suffering and silence will kill you. And sadly, it will take a really, really long time to kill you. So speak, right? If you're hurting, let people know. I promise it's a great idea. You're going to be much happier in the long run. I'm Captain Tommy. The cat is thousands of miles away. Spanky. Pop that. Look at you, you handsome. Did you? It is I. Uh, You're looking very, very brightly lit, Calhoun. Holy hell. Am I? Boy, oh boy. Am you I? see these people? Yeah. I you changed the, the camera angle, too. Sorry. Let's get this. How's yes, that? we did uh, change the camera angle, too. And we will. Uh, but I'm proud of you, Calhoun. You, uh, Thanks, you killed it. Yep, you did well. I'm very, very, uh, I'm very, very pleased. It's a, I had a lot of fun thing. under the under the best of circumstances. Now, you'll not be uh, you'll not be playing with watches at any point, but I'm going to let you sit in front of the mic. Okay. No, I I'll, ta you, I'll take it. Would you like to try to learn to uh, fix watches, Mike? I can. can you yeah, imagine how badly you would hate me if we tried to do that? I'm telling you, people. There's nothing more frustrating on planet Earth than working on a watch. If we tried to do it together, we'd kill each other in about two days. But I think we can do this one, Cal, huh? Yeah, we can do this one. He is handsome. Is he not, Dirty Mouse? That's my kid. He's a handsome guy. All right, Calhoun, I love you. Love you too, and, Dad. Uh, and the general consensus is that the, ooh, the lighting is working for you. Love Thanks. the Spanx Boat Live, says Izzy. How about that? Spanx Boat Live. Love it. All right, people. I'm Captain Tommy Scoville. Not sure what's going on tonight. Maybe there'll be Spanx Boat Live. We'll have to see. I'm Captain Tommy, and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye.